Welcome to Sit Down News. Tonight I'm going to speak about my newest blog, The Ultimate Gangster Part 4, which is the final part of um, my dear friend Johnny Santori. Um, it, it, it was a difficult one to write, very emotional to think back about everything that took place with him. And I did my best. I hope that I did him some justice. Um, one afternoon, I had asked John for a, a lift and I was going up to the club on 101st Avenue. And he, he drove me there and I seen John Jr. He was actually standing in front of his father's club, the Bergen Hunt and Fish Club. And we used to go into a side block uh, a club. I think it was called Our Friends Social Club. It belonged to uh, John Jr.'s uncle, Richie. But that day, uh, I told John, pull over. And I got out. You know, I thanked him, and he, he drove away. And John Jr. came walking over to me, and he said, you know, he wanted to know, who, who was that? Who just dropped you off? So I said, oh, I was Johnny Santori. And he, like, looked at me surprised. He said, Johnny Santori, how do you know Johnny Santori? So I like, I said, John, I know him since I'm a kid. And um, he said, let me tell you something. He said, he called his father the chief. He said, the chief himself thinks and calls Johnny Santori a tough guy, which didn't surprise me. You know, they, these guys all came from East New York, Brooklyn. They all knew each other. And John definitely was a tough guy. Um, but I was a little surprised to hear John Jr. give somebody praise with the exception of his father, because, you know, he loved his father and always talked about his father. But I was so I was taken back a little bit that he was giving John that that his due and that I didn't even know that he knew who John was. Um, in 1988, I think I was about 19 years old. Um, John had mentioned about going out for a couple of drinks that night. And one night, um, we have, I have been out with him drinking a lot. John loved wild turkey. <laughs> he loved to drink uh, whiskey. And uh, John kind of looked at himself like, a, like an old cowboy at times. And um, so he said, let's go over to that Butterfingers. Now, Butterfingers uh, belonged to Vinnie Sara. And Vinnie Sara was a skipper with the Bonanno family. And for People who may have known a few years ago, they tried him on a Lufthansa case. He winds up beating that case, and then he goes away for some burning of a car. I, I believe he just got out, and he's he's up there in age now. Um, so unbeknown to us, we take my car, and like I said, unbeknown to us, we park outside. We go to go in a place, and the place is swarming with members of the Gambino family. I had mentioned a bunch of them, um, Jojo Carrazzo, Blaze, uh, the little Jackie Cavallo. Um, there was a bunch of guys there, including, including Pete Gotti and Tommy Sneakers. And when we walked in, everyone started coming over to John, everybody. I mean, with the exception of Pete and this uh, Tommy Sneakers, the whole place came over to John. Were, hey, Johnny, you're back. You know, and they were all kidding around with him, questioning him. And you could see John loved, he loved it. And, you know, he was making small talk. I went and sat at the bar and I let him do his thing. But he didn't leave me there for long. He came over to the bar and he told the uh, bartender to give us uh, two wild turkeys. We, had, we were drinking whiskey that night. And, um, Everything was fine, as I wrote in the blog, and he was in a good mood, John. And then all of a sudden, I felt tension. And I noticed John was staring across the bar, and who was standing there was Pete and Tommy Sneakers. And Tommy Sneakers was staring back at John. So I knew, <laughs> I knew there was going to be a beef. I knew there was trouble. There was trouble going to gonna happen and I quickly tried to kid around with John and I was trying to 
get his mind elsewhere and get his attention away from them. He was zeroed in on Tommy Sneakers right now. And at one point, he just got up and he told me to he just wait here. And he proceeded to go around the bar and he was going towards Pete and uh, Tommy Sneakers. So I wasn't going to sit there, um, you know, and let me just say for the record, here I was a young guy and these, you know, these are all well-known, you know, wise guys in the place. And I was definitely nervous. You know, I'm a young guy and now there's about to be a beef in here. I'm here with John. I'm not going to just sit at the bar. So I got up and I started following John over to them. And um, I think he was originally going to walk, but I didn't write in the blog. He originally was headed right towards Tommy Sneakers, but Pete stepped in front of him like to shield him. And he turns around and tells John, I don't know if you heard who I am now. <laughs> I knew, and I was only a young guy, but I knew enough that it was going to go all downhill for Pete at that point because he definitely said the wrong thing. These guys were there celebrating the induction of Pete that night. Um, how did I know? It was very obvious, but especially with Pete told John. And thereafter, I find out that, you know, they straightened Pete out. That's something that flew around the neighborhood, you know. But I knew he said the wrong thing. And um, he also, as a friend, and I speak as a former friend, you, you're you not supposed to talk like that. Those words are not supposed to come out of your mouth. Do you know who I am? Whatever way you worded, I don't know if you heard who I am. That's what he happened to say to John. But And John was very well versed. He knew that was a no-no. And John told him, who are you? He says, you're a fucking sanitation worker to me. For those people that don't know, um, Pete Gotti used to work for the sanit sanitation department. Obviously, John knew about that. And John then told him, he says, you know, talk to me when you, when you pick brains out of your pocket, not when you uh, park three blocks away with a walkie-talkie in your hand. And what, obviously, what, what John told him was, I guess at the time, the Gambino family, there was a lot of murders taking place. Most likely, John had heard from somebody, I don't know how, I don't know if this is true or not, that probably Pete at one point was part of a hit team and maybe was in a car with a walkie-talkie. I, I, I'm, I'm not sure of if this took place or not or why John said that to him, if John was just being sarcastic to him, but that's what he said to him. And um, both Pete and Tommy Sneak is, Pete's face was red, excuse me, both of them put their heads down. They didn't even look at John after he said that. They didn't want no part of John. And John stood there a minute looking at them, and then he turned around, and now he sees me standing there. And I, he wasn't surprised. He said, let's go. And um, no goodbyes. The whole place got quiet. Everybody seen, uh, at least seen what was going on. I think some guys definitely were in earshot to hear that. And those that are li listening that were there that night know exactly what I'm talking about. And um, what I didn't, so we... We go out, and what I never mentioned in the, in the blog was that, in my mind, I said, oh, they're definitely killing me. I witnessed this, and, you know, who the, who the hell am I? I'm a young kid, and it was, it was, uh, it was bad for Pete. It was, humili he humili humiliated Pete. And um, we go over, and John had the keys, and he goes and walks around the car, and he looks at me, and he says, I thought I told you at, back at the bar to, to, to wait to wait there. So I said, John, I, you know, I wasn't just going to sit there. And we got in the car and it was like December. And it was like a blizzard that night. I remember it was a blizzard. And John's driving. And at the time, I lived in Lindenwood with my mother. And, he, you know, he, he gets through Howard Beach, goes the back way. As, as, as everybody knows, goes down, I think, 84th Street, and we go into Lindenwood, but he never makes it bringing me to where I live. 
about three, four blocks away, he just pulls over and his, he was quiet. His mind was thinking. And he said, all right, get out. <laughs> so I said, I said, John, what do you mean get out? I don't live here. He says, you know, let's go. I'll see you in the morning. And I didn't argue. I got out of the car and I watched him pull away and I started walking. I remember it was coming down the snow. And I was just wondering, like, where is he going? I, I'm thinking he's going back there. You know, because I, I don't know what to think. I don't know where John's going. But it it turns out that John gets in touch with me the next day and tells me that he's coming to bring me back the car. I was happy to hear from him. I, know I didn't know what was going to happen that night. And um, I remember he always used to beep the horn, you know, so he was beeping the horn. And he was parked out there. A couple of times I remember making him wait. I was blow drying my hair and he was got, you know, he was yelling, what, what, you know, what are you doing? But that, that particular day I was ready and I came out of the house and he was parked in front of the house. And um, we started driving. He said he had his car parked by his aunt's house. And um, I had asked him, he was in a good mood. I seen he had the music on and I said to him, you know, where did you go last night? What, you know, what happened? You know, I, you know, he says, he says, oh, I went to go see uh, Johnny and Jeannie Gotti. I went up, I went up to the club, which he meant the Bergen Hunt Fish Club. And so John, John knew enough that there obviously was going to be a problem, especially from what he just said. So he went directly to the source, which was John and Jeannie. And, you know, they basically, they knew about it already, according to John. And he said, they basically told me, Johnny, don't worry about it. That's over with. He says, and you know, they, he stood a little while. He made small talk with them and he left. Didn't seem concerned at all. Um, I, I mentioned in the uh, blog, looking back, John was not a guy. He didn't want to discuss nothing. He was very, very closed mouth. But I believe that he answered me. One, he was in a good mood. And two, I think that he respected that. I got up and, and walked over there with him because regardless of what was going to happen that night, I would have been there for John to help John, whether it meant getting myself killed or not. I was not going to just sit at the bar and watch from over. I don't, you know, I don't know what was going to happen. So I think, you know, I know John and I know John respected that. So, as I said, I kind of pressed my luck a little bit. I says, John, you know, you left me walking and, you know, you didn't even bring me to the house. I was a couple of blocks away and he just looked at me and left. I don't know. I wasn't drinking that much, but I, I, I guess he must have figured he was so mad. He didn't even realize he just pulled over and threw me out of the car. But um, as I said, um, and I'm not trying to knock Tommy sneakers, but uh, Blaze Carrazzo one night, we were, we, this is, now I'm a friend and I'm jumping ahead. Um, I was, I was with Johnny Cyburns. I was with Blaze and, and um, um, Cesar Carino, another skipper with the Campinos. And we were talking with them inside of Gino's Pizzeria, another good spot in Howard Beach, try it out. Um, and I think Tommy Sneakers had just walked in and then walked out and Blaze had said to me, did you meet him yet? Have he, has, has he met you? And I said, no. So I, I knew who he was, obviously, from that night. And um, he saw, come on, come walk outside. I want to introduce you. And, like, he went over to him and he said he was going to introduce me. And he just had this, like, kind of, like, this air about him, you know, like, like a high and mighty air, you know. And... I remember him acting that way and Blaze did the introduction. And, you know, I said, you know, it was a pleasure to meet you and all that, kissed him all. And he like had this air about him. And I remember smiling, you know, internally smiling to myself, remembering him that night, hiding behind Pete with his head down. But anyway, that's neither here nor there. So by, by 1989, I wind up getting myself in trouble. Um, I, I wind up getting out on bail at, at a certain point and with myself and my friend and co-defendant, uh, Michael Ligori, we call him uh, a fact, Blaze Carrazzo named Michael because he used to fight 
I think he fought in the Golden Gloves. He named him Mikey the Boxer. So that was Michael's nickname. Mike, if you're listening, how are you, pal? Um, and, you know, John's take on it, on the whole thing of making this terrible decision that I made back then to get myself in trouble, and Michael too, um, he started calling me a big dummy. He would say, you big dummy. And um, as I wrote, at a certain point, we, um, we go in. You know, we went to trial and we wind up getting convicted and, and we go in. And John used to come up to visit me all the time. Um, and right when I went in around that time, there was a time that he came up and he told me that him and Paulie do the score. And he said that, and Paulie's Paulie G. Gazzara, he was kind of like John's partner all the time. John loved him. And Paul, Paulie was a tough guy. Paulie was a big thief. I, I mentioned him already. Uh, he mostly a jewel, a jewel thief, but Paulie did scores all the time. I think I mentioned that he had had the uh, suede, the ultra suede sports coat that he charged me sixty dollars for. Um, anyway, John told me that they went in there to do the score, and at that time, you know, when I was I was Atari. A lot, a lot, a lot of uh, guys probably remember, uh, or women probably remember Atari as the big game system that was out there. But Sega, the Sega Genesis came out. I never got to see it because I went away, and it was a big. It was like the hottest item that that year. And um, John told me that he said that him and Paulie, they break into this warehouse. And they break in on like a Saturday, a late, I mean, sorry, on a late Friday night. And they stayed at inside the place the whole weekend. I, what they were doing or I, I don't know. I, he didn't get into th those details. If they had a truck in there, they had, they had to get the stuff out of there somehow. But um, he said that a couple of times the, the cops came by. Oh, I don't know if he meant flat. He said, we've seen their lights. I don't know if he meant headlights flashlights spotlights and he just said that they stood still and they just waited for them to leave and they went back to work and he kidding around he said that uh he says you know a lot of christmas trees in the neighborhood got that sega game on there this year because you know they had to get rid of them and off these things so they must have made a lot of money and um i wind up um finding a picture of paulie and i put the i put the picture up of paulie you can see he was a shop sharply dressed guy Paulie was always dressed to the nines anyone who knows Paulie they know that about him Paulie also according to what I heard designed was it sister sledge something one of these groups I'm not really familiar with it or sister stone or stone in the sledge somebody correct me um he was a designer too um and he would Paulie was one of the first guys that I that I know of not the first guys. He was he was a guy who designed, I believe, one of the first when you had the leather jackets with the fur in it. Paulie had shown me a jacket, and it was a three quarter, like soft as butter, um, a black leather jacket. And he took it to a furrier and had them put mink all inside, down inside the sleeves. The whole thing was all, and he says, "Hey," and the jacket weight was heavy. And he, he, I said, wow, Paulie, where'd you get this? He said, I designed it. I, I believe him. I heard that he had designed um, some clothes for some uh, group. And he was always impeccably dressed, as you could see from the picture. Um, moving forward, Ciro Perone at some point winds up straightening his son Jimmy out. And that means that he's inducting him into the family. He's going to be part of his father's crew. So now like 20 years plus have gone by with kind of John being chased, right? And, you know, like I said, John went, went out to Red Chetty's house in, um, in Jersey and he would come into New York and, you know, stay in Jersey and John would bounce back and forth all the time. But when they straightened Jimmy out, he confesses to his father that John was innocent from back then 
of taking the money that he confesses to his father that it was it was himself it wasn't john and um so jimmy obviously tells john a story and john's relaying the story to me and what i didn't put in the blog was anthony guzzo and myself and anthony's a friend with the lucases were in fishkill at the time when john we got on the phone with John and he's explaining that he met with Jimmy, the story I'm about to tell you. And I think Anthony was just ready to go home. And I, I, I might've had a parole board coming up and it was iffy and obviously I didn't make it. And we were on the phone trying to tell John, don't go. We felt they were calling. We felt he was calling him in to kill him. And we were saying, John, don't go wait for us to get out, you know, wait for us to come home. And Anthony's getting out. And, and he hung up on us. <laughs> He got, let me go. He hung up the phone. He got pissed off at us. So I didn't put that in the blog. Um, anyway, now going back to Jimmy, Jimmy. So Ciro tells Jimmy, I don't care what you got to do, how long it takes, how long it takes, go find them. And he tells, Jimmy tells John, I never seen my father cry before. My father had tears in his eyes. And then he got very angry with him and, and, and uh, kind of told Jimmy that, I'll say it nicely that I guess he shouldn't have been conceived <laughs> that he should have went down his leg. The women that are watching, I don't want to go into detail, but you know what I mean. And he was very upset with, with his son, you know, obviously, because he really didn't love John. And, you know, I guess he, now he's wrong, you know, and, um, and Ciro was a tough guy himself. You know, everybody that knows Ciro knows that. And John doesn't listen to obviously me and Anthony and myself. And he goes in, I don't know how they set it up or where he goes, if he goes to the club, I don't know those details, but he meets with Ciro. And immediately Ciro puts him back and he's back in the mix in the crew. And um, he tells me, you know, now John is back with Ciro and everyone's seeing John a lot more. In the neighborhood, matter of fact, John leaves Jersey and leaves Vichetti's house. And above the club on 89th Street, Ciro's Club, are apartments up there. And John takes one of the apartments. So now John's back living in Ozone Park again. You know, he has no reason to be in Jersey anymore. And plus, he's right up down. He lives right upstairs from the club. And John was John was a, John was a club guy. John was a guy that would sit outside the club. And, you know, read the newspaper and, and he had the, that, that board, with, he would take the sun with that board, the reflection board. He was one of those kind of guys. He, John was a club type of guy. He even had my young son hanging around, <laughs> hanging around with him out there at the club. Then, and they would meet every Sunday for breakfast in the old blue fountain, which is for those of you who knows the diner in Howard Beach, and I think now it's the Cross Bay Diner, he would take my son with him um, every Sunday. And so anyway, um, John told me, he says, hey, listen to this. He says, you know, when I went back around the club, he says, you know, there's a lot of new guys. Don't forget, it's 20 plus years. It's a lot of new faces, a lot of new guys. He says, I don't really know these guys. He says, and one of the guys went over to one of the old timers. I forget which one, which one it was. And he basically said like, well, who is this guy? You know, he's always coming around here every day for, and the guy basically told him, um, he said, listen, that's the guy who will whack you without even a conversation. And that's a, 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 a definite fact. And he, so John left, he says, the guy told me, you know, what he told the guy, he says, and no one ever asked what I was doing there ever again, but he was so close to Ciro. I think Ciro had him back. He would drive him around and, and all of that. So, as I said, um, it, it was um, it was rough uh, writing writing this part, and um, I, you know, I'm not really an emotional guy, but I had tears coming down my my face when I when I when I was writing this this one part here. So on my last visit uh, with John, he came up to visit me. I was in Fishkill, and I had an upcoming parole hearing. And, you know, you always have a glimmer of hope that you might be released. I wasn't. 
um, and he said to me, you know, let me tell you something. He says, and I want you to listen to me carefully. Don't think that you're coming home and you're going to, you're going to be going up the block with those guys. And what he meant is by the uh, Gambino club, he said, you're going to, you're going to come with me. He says, I, so I keep my eye on you. He's kidding around with me. But um, he also just went for, he had a stent put in and um, they had denied him. He had, a, he needed a second stent and the insurance company, a great health healthcare in this uh, country, denied him. They denied him for the second stent. And um, a while after that visit, um, I think it was December of 2002, very close to Christmas, like Christmas Eve was a day or two away, something like that. And my mother came up on a weekend and brought my kids up and possibly my grandmother at the time, I don't remember. And we had the visit and just as a, every other visit, when they would go home, I would wait at a certain time and I would call home to make sure that they got home okay. And um, my mother answered the phone and she was hysterical. So right away, my, my heart was in my throat and I, 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 you know, I'm wondering what it could be. It's, you know, obviously it's not good news. And she's telling me that they found John. She said, he's dead. She's crying. And, you know, the first thought was only because of that life and, you know, the way John lived his life was that somebody killed him. And, and I was like, I was just heartbroken, destroyed, you know, and I didn't want him to have to go that way. And, you know, and then further as we were talking and she said to me, you know, he had, they found him, he was, he was um, laying besides his, his, his couch in his living room. But that still don't mean that somebody didn't go and, and kill him. And I said, well, how, how, how did he die? Did, did somebody, did they kill him? She said, no, no, I, I think he had a heart attack. She says, he had a smile on his face. So I, I felt, obviously, I felt devastated that I lost him. But I was, I was happy that he didn't, um, that he didn't, that he didn't get killed. And that, you know, at least he, um, he passed away from a heart attack. Uh, so that was that. Um, um, that night, I remember I literally cried myself to sleep. And, you know, I just kept my thoughts on John was the pictures that I put at the end of the blog of him with my kids, because that's who John was to me. A lot of people probably think, oh, he idolized him because he was a killer. And, you know, did I at one time? Yes. Um, but my heart belonged, uh, you know, John was in my heart because of the way he treated my family and how he was with my children. And, and I had, there was no way for me to do those things. I was, I wasn't there. And, you know, he, he would take my, um, my, my son to his ball games, uh, although he wasn't the best, but he used to say, He's not the best baseball player, but he would he would take him to his ball games, and he would like I just mentioned he would take him every Sunday, and he would take him with the guys, and they would, and they would go to have that breakfast on Cross Bay, and he would bring him to the club, and you know I know and John knew that my son needed men around you know men around him because he was always around women unless he was coming up to see me, and you know those are the things that I remember about John and that I loved about John is that as tough as he was and as dangerous as he was, was as big as his heart was and, and the way he treated me and my family. And I, I even mentioned, I see here, I said, um, I, what I didn't say is when he would call me a big dummy, you know, I would just look at him and he would say, you know, I love you. And, you know, here's a guy who, lost his mother and father and his life. I'm not making excuses for him, but you know, he had a rough life, John. And um, so that's what I remember about my friend. And, you know, both him and Pete have now passed. And I, I wrote that, I, you know, God rest their souls. And I mean that. 
I hope you guys in, in, enjoyed this story. Um, I really kind of let everybody in, in on someone who was very, very close to me. Um, you know, that's, that's about it. I hope you enjoy your night. Have a nice night. Please, <laughs> one moment. If you haven't subscribed, subscribe. Um, and um, thank you for everyone who has. Good night.